When Jesus Christ died, we died with him. Though he slays me, yet will I trust in him. I want to welcome you this morning to Berean Bible Church. We just a couple weeks ago began a study of the Upper Room Discourse in John 13. Now, this discourse begins with the uh, Lord's Supper <clears throat> and the Lord washing the disciples' feet. I think we all understand that Yeshua washed the feet of the disciples, but maybe what we don't understand is why. And you'll get various answers to that question. Uh, so that's what we want to look at today. Why? You know, last week we had titled the message, Yeshua Washes Feet, and today we added the why. Why does He wash feet? Uh, this passage that we're looking at can be divided up into three sections. The first three verses form an introduction, basically. Verses 4 through 11 are a narrative of the foot washing, and then verses 12 through 17 give us the interpretation of the foot washing. So today we're going to look at the interpretation. And let me just ask you this Whose feet is our Lord washing? Apostles, disciples, how many? All right. As we look at this upper room discourse, which is the Lord's teaching on the last night of His life, I think there's something we need to understand here. There were more than just 12 people in that room with Yeshua, in that upper room. You know, forget about the painting you see, you know, with the 12 guys all on the same side of the table, posing for their picture, Okay. <laughs> That's, uh, that's not reality, all right? We don't know how many people were present at that meal, but I'm confident that it was more than just the 12. If you look at Mark's Gospel, and just kind of focus on Mark's Gospel, you'll get the idea that it was just Yeshua and the 12 in that upper room. And that's because Mark concentrates his attention on the 12 and rarely mentions anybody else, any other disciples other than the 12. But in Luke's Gospel, we see that Yeshua had a large number of disciples. In Luke 6.17, it says, He came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of His disciples. So here's a whole crowd. of Now watch what it says. And a great multitude of people from all over Judea, Jerusalem. So you got a great crowd of disciples, and then you got a multitude of people. So I mean, He's making a point to distinguish. There's a whole lot of disciples there in this crowd that are following Him. In Luke 10, 1, it says, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them out ahead of Him, two by two, into every town and place where He Himself was about to go. Now, you notice the text here says 72. The New American Standard, the King James, and the Young's literal translation. I have to emphasize that because I always say living. Young's literal translation has the word just 70. Now, it doesn't say 72, just 70. Now, there are several manuscripts that, that say 72, they, and some there's quite a few translations that do that. <clears throat> Sometimes the Jews would choose six out of every tribe because this was a number of the Sanhedrin, and that's where they come up with the 72. But the names of these 70 disciples are found in the margins of some ancient manuscripts. And so there, but there's a lot of question of the accuracy of that, but it actually names them. So what I, what I want you to focus on here is there's, he's sending out these 70, these disciples that they're going out to carry out the Gospel. So there's really no reason to believe that only the 12 were with the Lord in that upper room. Acts 1 tells us about a time when the 11 remaining apostles named a replacement for Judas. And they began by selecting two men. But notice what is said about the group which these two came out of in Acts 1.21. So, one of the men who have, so of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Yeshua went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when He was taken up from us, one of these men... Must become, must become with us a witness to His resurrection. So this text teaches us that Yeshua had many loyal disciples that accompanied Him throughout His time here on earth. And it's just hard to believe that some of them would have not been there at that Last Supper. 
Something Yeshua said also indicates the presence of others at the Last Supper. Yeshua tells them that one of them will betray Him. And they ask Him, who? And He replies, He said to them, it's one of the twelve. One who is dipping bread into the dish with Me. Now the twelve is a specific designation that refers to the twelve apostles. The term disciple is a broad term that refers to any who followed Yeshua. Now, if Yeshua and the twelve were the only ones in that upper room, and someone asked him, who's going to betray you? And he says, one of the twelve. Well, no kidding. That's all that's here. I mean, but if there's others and they say, who's going to betray you? And he says, one of the twelve. Oh, one of the twelve is going to do it? There's other people there. There's no reason to say one of the twelve if that's all there was. Just say one of you. All right? Okay, so there's more in that room together than just him and the twelve apostles. Now, in the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at these first eleven verses. I want to run over a couple of these quickly just to set your thinking, and then we'll move on to the why of the foot washing. He says, Now, before the feast of Passover, when Yeshua knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, Having loved His own who were in the world, He loved them to the end. The full extent of Yeshua's love is demonstrated in His washing the feet of the disciples, which foreshadows His sacrificial death on the cross. He loved them to the end. The end of His life, and He loved them to the utmost. All He could love them. Verse 3 says, The Father had given all things unto His hand. This is the one who can claim the highest status in all reality, the sovereign over all creation, he humbles himself to the lowest of human status. And what I want you to see here is when Yeshua stands up, disrobes and begins to wash the feet, he is acting from a position of strength. Okay, get that. This is a servant's role, but he's acting from a position of strength. He is expressing His power by getting up from supper, laying aside His garment, and washing their feet. This is a radical overturning of common cultural values with respect to status. This is not right culturally. This is unheard of and this is shocking. But people, that's what we have to understand about Christianity. It turns the culture upside down in in this in the fact of the view and some of the things that the culture holds to, especially our culture. Now remember the context here? According to Luke 22, at the moment that He begins to wash His disciples' feet, what had just gone on before this? The disciples are having an argument about what? Who's the greatest? They're all sitting around arguing, hey, who's the greatest in the kingdom? And as they're arguing and fighting over who's the greatest, the sovereign God of the kingdom gets up and begins to show them who the greatest is. The greatest is a slave. The greatest is a servant. He says he rose from supper, he laid aside his outer garments, taking a towel, he wrapped it around his waist, He poured water in the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was wrapped around Him. Now, in our last study, we looked at the cultural significance of foot washing. And I want to stress that significance again and just maybe add a few things here because I think we really need to grasp this. For those of Yeshua's day, foot washing was a necessary and a regular chore as taking a shower would be for most modern people today. Please get this. Foot washing was a necessary and a regular chore. It was something that needed to be done. you got to hang on to that, okay? It's going to be important in a little bit here. It's a necessary chore. Foot washing appears in the ancient literature most often as preparation for a meal. Okay, you're getting ready for the meal, and you wash your feet. You're like, that makes no sense. Okay, no, to our culture, it doesn't make sense. But to them, they're not sitting at an upright table. 
They're leaning, they're reclining on their arms and their feet are outward and you got somebody's feet near you and they're all nasty and dirty because they've been walking through the dust and dirt all they had is sandals on. So when you come in, you wash their feet so you have this meal and you don't have this stinky, muddy feet in your face as you're eating dinner. All right? It was, a, it was a duty of hospitality. Washing someone's feet was an unpleasant task, as you can imagine, which no one except a servant or a slave could be expected to do. They didn't expect anybody to do this but a servant or slave. And we said even a, a, a Jewish slave they didn't want to do, they'd get a Gentile to do it. It was, in fact, the typical servant task. The one thing that no one else should do. Now in a household without servants, everybody was expected to wash their own feet. Here's your water, take care of your stuff. Nobody here is going to do that for you, okay? So that's what... Now, in a society highly conscious of relative status, it would be unthinkable for this servant act to be performed for an inferior by a superior on the social scale. Whenever it was done, and there were times when it was done, you know, not by someone who wasn't a servant, but the person of lower status would always wash the feet of the person of a higher status. It would be a contradiction of their social relationship to do it the other way around. And there were instances in which a pupil might wash the feet of a teacher. And that would be an extraordinary show of devotion. I mean, you're showing this teacher, this you we just really love what you're doing, we think you're awesome, and so we're going to wash your feet. But the reverse was never done. Abraham is a man who was famous for his hospitality to strangers. But notice his response to Yahweh and two angels. Genesis 18. And Yahweh appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre, and he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from his tent door to meet them, and he bowed himself to the earth, and he said, O Lord, if you have found favor in your if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. So Abraham sees these visitors as superiors, right? He's bowing to them. He calls himself a servant. So, as his servant, he should wash their feet, right? Well, notice the next verse. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourself under the tree. What's strange about that verse? He says, let me get you some water so you can take care of your own stuff. You wash your own feet. Listen, one of the visitors is Yahweh, and Abram says, wash your own feet. Now, what's interesting here is in the Septuagint of this verse, Abraham's servants wash the visitor's feet. The Septuagint, a Brenton translation is translated from the Septuagint, and it's different in places, but it says, let water now be brought and let them wash your feet. In other words, let the servants do it. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Now, the translators of the Septuagint, knowing that Abraham had servants, well, thought, you know, it's more hospitable if the servants do the foot washing instead of just giving somebody some water. So they translate it as, let them wash the feet. Now, there's a pseudepigraphal work called the Testament of Abraham. And in the Testament of Abraham, Abraham himself washed the feet of the three guests. In A6.6, it records Abraham as saying, when I was washing his feet. So you got these different records here. Abraham says, here's some water. Septuagint says, the, disciples, the servants do it. Uh, pseudepigraphal work. Testament of Abraham says, Abraham does it. Well, bottom line here, the Scriptures tell us Abraham didn't wash these visitors' feet. He seems to un- have understood that they were divine, and yet he still doesn't wash their feet. And as I said earlier, washing feet was a typical servant task. It was something nobody else was going to do. That's a servant's job. So here is our Lord. Again, they're fighting. 
I'm better than you. I'm better than you. I, I should be higher in status around here. I should be leader in the king. I should sit at the right hand. And the Lord disrobes and begins to wash their feet. People, this is a shocking slap upside the head to these people who are sitting there arguing among themselves. Wait a second. I mean, they would literally be shocked. And that's why Peter says, oh man, never. This is culturally unacceptable. You can't do this, Lord. Now, as I said, foot washing was a task that needed to be done. And they're here at dinner and they're arguing and yet didn't do it, so the Lord did it. And I think it was also a way that Yeshua could demonstrate His unfathomable love for His disciples. Lazarus understands that foot washing in relation to the cross, where Yeshua, who in chapter 13, undertakes the role of a slave and finally dies the death of a slave on the cross. Verse 8, Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Again, this is not right, Lord. You're violating, you're destroying culture. Never should a superior wash the feet of an inferior. So Peter is humbly saying, I'm inferior to you, you can't do this. Yeshua answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. No share. Now look at verse 10. Yeshua said to him, the one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you're clean, but not every one of you. Now, in 13.8, the word wash here is the Greek word nipto, which means to wash parts of the body. If you're going to wash your hands, you'd say nipto, I'm going to go wash my hands. While the word bathe in 13.10 is luo, and it means to bathe all over. If you're going to take a shower, you say, I'm going to go luo. So Yeshua is saying the one who has been bathed all over only needs to wash his feet. His feet got dirty. You had a bath, but your feet got dirty on the roads, and now you need that clean. So the initial and fundamental cleansing that Christ provides is a once-for-all act. Regeneration. Once you have believed in the Lord, you have been born again. All right, You don't need a cleansing again in the sense of a total cleansing. You're clean. But you need a daily, continual cleansing from sin that you pick up as you're walking through this world. We need cleansing from the acts of sin to maintain our fellowship. We don't need another bath. And as we talked about last week, I see this foot washing as a picture of an ongoing daily cleansing that we need to keep a relationship with the Lord. And I see foot washing as greatly connected to our time in the Word of God. You can't fellowship with someone you don't know, and you can't know someone you don't spend time with. And the only way to spend time with the Lord is in the Word. Reading it, studying it, memorizing it. And as we do that, we are cleansed. As we spend time in the Word, James says it's a mirror it holds up to us, and we see, oh man, that's not right, i got to fix that. And it causes us to come to the Lord in confession and forgiveness and say, Lord, that's not right, I don't need to do that. And I don't understand how a believer can walk in fellowship with the Lord without spending time in the Word. And listen, people, we don't have any excuses. You can make them up, but we don't have any excuses. This culture is into entertainment more than anything else. We work less than any people around, and yet we don't have time for anything because we're too busy entertaining ourselves. We need to walk with the Lord in the Word. And I, I encourage you to read through the Bible once a year. All right, December's coming up. And, and Mike Sullivan is doing a daily thing. He's taking our stuff that we have on the website as far as the schedule of reading. And he goes through it each day and adds comments. And it's just encouraging. You know, you can go there. You can get some insight. It's in our fa on our Facebook page. on Yeah, on Facebook. Um, the brand page there. And it's there. And every day he goes through it. And just a time when, you know, in a year you'll go through the whole Bible. And when you get done with the year, you don't say, I did it, great. No, you start all over again. And the next year you start all over again. And every day, because you have to keep being reminded. So we're going to, as we walk through this world, people, we're going to get our feet dirty and they need to be washed. And the Lord says, if I don't wash you, you just don't have fellowship with me. So, 
Now we come to Yeshua's interpretation of the foot washing in verses 12 through 17. And this really focuses on the reversal of values that come with the kingdom of God. This might be shocking to you, but the kingdom values are very different than our culture's values. You understand that? They're countercultural. But yet, it seems like we fit into the culture too much. Verse 12 When he had washed their feet, put on his outer garments, resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I've done to you? Now, the Greek words used here, uh, put on, and in verse 4, laid aside, these are unusual words. Instead of the usual words for taking off and putting on clothing, the text says that Yeshua laid aside, tithe me, and he put on, lambano, his garments. And these are verbs found elsewhere for laying down and taking up his life. See, this is a picture here. It's a picture of the kenosis, of the self-emptying and the dying of Christ. Then he asked the disciples, do you understand what I've done for you? So, in this verse, Yeshua begins to explain the significance of what he had just done. Although, the full comprehension would come later. He told them that in verse 7. I know you don't understand now. You'll get it later. But the Greek text here suggests, do you recognize what I have done? Well, they would say, uh, yeah, you washed our feet. We get that. Okay? Physically. But he was pointing to the symbolic meaning behind what he had just done. They understood he washed his feet. He knew they understood that. But do you understand what I'm doing? Do you recognize the significance, is what he's saying, of what I've done? And the answer would be, no, they didn't have a clue. The foot washing was shocking to them. But you know, it wasn't half as shocking as the notion of a Messiah that would die as a slave on a cross. So he's trying to get them to open their eyes and see the picture here. He says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. Now, the traditional Jewish title of rabbi and Lord are typical ways that the disciples or servants of a rabbi would address their master. Both titles were respectful and acknowledged Yeshua's superiority. Okay, so their colleague, they recognize you're superior, and yet you're washing our feet? The title Lord, Kurios, was first applied to Yeshua as a mark of respect for his teaching role, but after the resurrection, Lord took on a richer meaning to Christians as their understanding of who Yeshua was really took hold. He is the Lord. And those earlier Christians who used the Septuagint were used to using the title Lord for Yahweh. So now they're connecting this. So now we're calling Yeshua Lord because they recognized and understood who He was. Look at how He ends this verse. He says, for so I am. And again, using the I am, it seems He's invoking Yahweh's chosen way of identifying Himself in the Tanakh. Saying that He's Yahweh, the God of Israel, the ruler of the universe. In other words, He is so much more than just their rabbi and their Lord. He is their God. So you call me, Lord. You call me teacher, you're right. But I'm more than that, I'm your God. And if then, your Lord and teacher washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. Now the if here is a first class condition, we would translate this since. Since I, the Lord, your teacher, and your God have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. Does our text teach that we must literally wash the feet of others? I mean, we come to these verses in John 13, you ought to wash one another's feet. Nobody's washed my feet ever. Except me. (laughs) Yeah, my mama has, I guess she probably did that. I don't remember that, but she probably did, all right? (laughs) Now, there's some Christians who believe that Yeshua's command here is binding on the church in a literal sense. They practice foot washing as an ordinance of the church along with baptism and the Lord's Supper. The Grace Brethren, certain Mennonite churches, among others, view foot washing as an ordinance. It's something they do. Commenting on this verse, William Hendrickson writes, Foot washing was practiced among Maudie Thursday 
by the Church of Augustine's day. It was recommended by Bernard of Clairvieux in one of the sermon, uh, one of his sermons. The practice, moreover, was continued by the Pope at Rome and by emperors of Austria, of Russia, kings of Spain, Portugal, Bavaria. For while it was practiced by the church in England and by the Bavarians, it has been continued to this very day by certain Baptist and Adventist bodies. It was roundly condemned by Luther and his followers as an abominable papal corruption. So the church has been fighting over this for a long time, people. Should we wash feet? Should we not wash feet? So what do you think? Is foot washing something that Christians are called upon to practice today? I mean, we see what the Lord says there, right? You ought to wash one another's feet. Okay. You know, we have a problem when we come to Scripture because people want to say, well, this is literal. Well, you have to understand the different genres. and You have to understand what is literal and what's not literal. So, what is the point here? The Lord's saying, I need you to wash each other's feet because you all got dirty feet. Remember what I said earlier? Foot washing was a task that was needed to be done. Is it needed today? No, it's not, right? In the foot washing that happens at church today, you can be sure that nobody's feet are dirty. Okay? When people come to a foot washing service, they've washed their feet, they put their cleanest socks on, and they're, you know, it's not, there's no necessity to it. It's symbolism. It's not a need today. Nowhere in the New Testament or in the earliest extra biblical documents of the church. Is foot washing ever treated as an ecclesiastical rite, or as an ordinance, as a sacrament? This is it, people. These verses right here are it. The church doesn't talk about this until later when they start arguing about whether they should do it or not. We don't see this as a command repeated or practiced as an ordinance in the Acts or in the Epistles. Now, if it's something Christians should be doing, we should see them doing it. And I think Yeshua is not saying that uh, all Christians from here on should wash one another's feet. What he is saying is that all Christians should be humbly serving one another. Oh, well, I guess it's easier to wash feet than do that, right? Let's just have a service once a month, and we can treat each other roughly and however we want that way. No, the point here is he is giving an example of humble service. This is a need someone has. I'm going to humbly meet that need. We should be meeting each other's needs. It's not the point of you know, coming together once a month or once a year or whatever washing someone's feet in a symbolic manner. If Yeshua was giving an example to modern North American culture, I think He would have selected another ordinary daily chore that they could humbly do to serve one another. He is telling us that if foot washing is not beneath anyone's dignity, listen, nothing is. Nothing should be beneath our dignity in serving one another. In his culture, that's the lowliest task he could do, so he did that, and he said, you're to do the same. You're to serve your brother. I don't care how menial, I don't care how low the task is. Outside John 13, there's only one place in the New Testament that even references foot washing. Anybody know where it is? Anybody know who's, who's, do, who's doing it? Okay, it's in 1 Timothy 5.10. And this is a, talking about widows having a reputation for good works. If she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints. Now it's interesting here that we have a widow, not a slave, not a servant, but just a widow washing the feet of the saints. In other words, Christians are doing this to each other. Because it was a needed act of hospitality. It wasn't a ceremony. Everyone other than Christians would have expected a slave to do this or the guests to do it themselves. It was one of the most counter-culture practices of early Christianity. And it symbolized the most radical, the most status-rejecting ideals of the Christian community. Our culture says this is for slaves. Well, we serve one another, so they're doing it. And again, in the early church, this is a necessity. 
Christ commanded His disciples should wash feet, calls them to show love in various forms of service. Even laying down their lives for one another as necessary. You And see, again, this when Christ is doing this, He is picturing the crucifixion. He is picturing, picturing the fact that I love you to the end. I'm dying for you. You need to be willing to love one another in this same way, even if it means dying. We see this in 1 John 3.16. By this we know love. That He laid down His life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. He did it. We ought to do it. Now, you know what's interesting here? You know how Christians say, if I ever had the chance, I would lay down my life for somebody. Really? Okay, well, look at the next verse because this will make you a little more comfortable. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? You might say, I'm willing to die. Well, you want to do something? Then here, if your brother has a need, help them. He's teaching that we should do unpleasant tasks to serve others in the area of need. This means that no task is beneath us as we serve one another for Christ's sake. He says, I've given you an example. The Greek word translated example here is hupadigma. And it suggests both example and a pattern. By example, He has shown the disciples how they are to serve one another lovingly in complete humility as He has just served them in washing their feet. This is quite a contrast to the Old Covenant priesthood at that time. The priests thought they were above everybody. They were you know, high and lifted up. They demanded respect of the people. And He's saying, no, this is not how it is. You just serve one another. Now the example that Yeshua gave them was not just humility, it was sacrificial service. He served them. He did something for them that they needed to be done. Disciples were supposed to follow the teacher's example. That's the whole point. Later rabbis even used earlier rabbis' behavior as legal precedent. In other words, it wasn't just their teaching. Well, this rabbi did this, so now that's binding, and we ought to do that. We are called as believers to follow the rabbi. To do what He has done. He says in verse 16, Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent. Now the strong assertive truly, truly here is used at the beginning of a sentence and it's doubled. It's an authoritative call. Listen up! Pay attention to something important. Lazarus puts this in the form of an aphorism, which is a concise definition of a statement or a principle. By common assent, a slave or a servant occupies an inferior role to his or her master. And a messenger, apostolos, does the same to those who sent him. Matthew 10 says a disciple is not above his teacher nor a servant above his master. We understand that, right? That's, we get that. His point is that no disciple of his should think it beneath him or her to serve others. Since he, the master and sender, has humbled himself to serve. Remember that context of this foot washing. Let's look at the details that Luke gives us. This is right prior to the foot washing in Luke 22, 24. A dispute arose among them as to which of them should be regarded as the greatest. That's amazing that they write that stuff down, right? Wouldn't you be embarrassed if you're one of them and this is recorded for all the church to read that you guys are sitting around? Who, who should be regarded as the greatest? And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. In other words, it's different for Christians. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader as one who serves. So they're arguing about who's the greatest on that last night of his life. He's about to die and they're arguing who's the greatest. We don't really know what precipitated this conversation other than human pride. But in our society, 
as well as in theirs, greatness was measured by how many people served you. How many obeyed your command? How many catered to your needs? As a matter of fact, in the Jewish culture itself, great time was spent deciding the relative rank of individuals. We do the same thing. It was important to know where people fell in the pecking order. How one dealt with a superior was far different than how one dealt with an inferior. Status, authority, and titles were all important in the protocol of the Jewish religious community. I got to know how to treat you. I got to know where you're at. Are you above me? Are you below me? You know, can I treat you like dirt or I have to worship you? You know, how's that fit in? You know, we're not really any different today than those first century Jews. We compare ourselves with others and we desire the praise and the honor of others. The appetite for glory and greatness seems to be inbred in us. You know, when we do something, we want to make sure people, hey, are you paying attention? You see what I'm doing? Who doesn't cherish the ambition to be somebody? who others will admire rather than just be a nobody. We all tend to measure success and greatness by the criteria that the world uses. And then we take that criteria and we brought it to the church. See, the Lord's teaching the kingdom turns upside down these social things. But in the church, we turn them right back and we say, no, we'll just be like them. We want to be the leader in the church. We want to have the biggest congregation. We want the greatest following. We want the most converts. We want the most hits on YouTube. All these are considerations which the world forces upon its inhabitants where winning is everything. But it's not supposed to be this way in the church. Yeshua responded to the disciples' argument. You want to talk about greatness? He says, let's do that. Let's talk about greatness. But not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become the youngest and the leader as one who serves. So Yeshua takes these human values and He dumps them on their head. Turns it upside down. He says, you you see, we think greatness is about being first. Yeshua said, greatness is about being last. You know, we think greatness is about having a position of power or prestige where we can be served. Yeshua says greatness is about being a servant. These are kingdom principles, people. Greatness is servanthood. From Yeshua's perspective, a great person put everyone else before Him and takes the role of a servant. Yeshua's attitude toward the disciples and us here is, you want to pursue greatness? By all means, go for it. The only thing I want you to understand is that greatness in the kingdom is determined by service. So you understand the rules, you understand that to be great, you're the servant of all. Once you get that criteria down, you pursue greatness with all your heart. You'll be the greatest servant that ever lived. True greatness is manifest in humble servanthood. It's not how many serve me, it's how many I serve. And it's through humble servanthood that we are exalted by God. And people, what what we have to understand, this is a principle found all throughout the Word of God, in precept and in example. Okay? Let's look at a few of them. Matthew 23, 12. Whoever exalts himself, this is what most people do, will be humbled. But whoever humbles himself will be exalted. See, it's one principle with two sides. It's a promise. God promises, I will bring low those who exalt themselves. And it's a promise, I will exalt those who humble themselves. We see this principle illustrated and stated in Luke 18. you got two men that went into the temple to pray. These guys are going to pray. Okay, They're going to seek God. One is a Pharisee, the other is a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. Okay, this guy's just ate up with pride. You know, thank God, thank you. I'm so far superior to everybody else that's praying in this temple. I really stand out here, Lord. I'm not like other men. I'm not an extortioner, unjust, adulterer, or even like this tax collector over here who's praying. This guy, I'm not like him at all. 
You know, Lord, you know what I do? I fast twice a week. God must have went, wow, that's impressive. I give tithes of all that I get. So there's the comparison. You got this guy, he's so full of himself. You know, he's compared, looking around the temple and the people are praying and he's exalting himself by everybody around. Then he goes, but the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now watch. I tell you, this man, the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So there's a picture of it. And the principle given again. James gives us the principle. In 4.10 he says, Humble yourselves before the Lord. He'll exalt you. So we can strive for the exaltation of people, or we can strive to have the Lord exalt us. Peter put it this way, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud. Do you get that, people? God opposes the proud. So if you want to have God opposed to you, you just be ate up with yourself, all right? But it says, He gives grace to the humble. So humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that in the proper time, He may exalt you. Yeshua said it. Peter said it. James said it. Paul said it. It's a biblical law. Exaltation follows humility. Just as sure as the law of thermodynamics is the law that those who humble themselves will be exalted and those who exalt themselves will be humble. We see the negative side of this in the principle in the life of the king Nebuchadnezzar. Remember him back in Daniel? He exalted himself. Look at this garden that I've made. Man, I am just, I'm the most wonderful king. I'm the most powerful king. I'm the greatest thing that ever lived. And so God said, I'm done with you. Boom. And so what happened? The next scene, he's out in the lawn eating grass and his hair's grown out and he's just like a wild man living among the animals. But when he humbled himself, God exalted him. And verse 37 says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor, not myself, but the King of Heaven. For all His works are right and His ways are just, and those who walk in pride, He is able to humble. He understood that principle because He just came out of seven years of living like an animal. The teaching of Scripture is clear. God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. And yet, the seeking of glory and power is just filled the church throughout its ages. The church has followed the culture of the world. We have revered bishoprics, papal thrones, ornate mitres, monuments to power litter the pages of church history. The ambitious Pope Leo X sold indulgences to lay the foundation for his lasting monument to St. Peter even though he didn't even understand the Gospel. King James I of King James Bible fame, he sought to use the Episcopal form of church government to secure his own position in spite of objections of the Puritans and other nonconformists. <coughs> People, I think you see this. The church in our own generation is filled with pride. Churches desire the title of world's largest Sunday school. They've resorted to all kinds of gimmicks and numerical sleight of hand to receive men's accolades. A couple of decades back, a Southern Baptist church determined to lead the denomination in baptism totals. So they would go to the local bus station, they'd grab a group of converts, take them to church, dunk them, and take them back and drop them off at the bus stop. So they could say, we had this many baptisms. People, I've seen this firsthand. I was involved in a Baptist church. And every year they had this Baptist conference where all the independent Baptists would get together at a conference, big conference where they're all together. The Sunday before that conference every year was a huge push to get as many people in the church as possible. Why? Because he's going to the conference and he can tell, I had this many people in church on Sunday. And I was a youth pastor and he'd say, how many can you have in church on Sunday? I said, how much money are you going to give me? 
I could buy all the pizza. And I would say, okay, we're having free pizza, free this, free that, free mo-. We used four buses to bring kids in there. I had over 200 kids in Sunday school class, teenagers. Bring, give me the money, I'll get all you want. But that was so they could go to that conference and say, look how many people we had. We had a bus ministry. And so they wanted, you know, you got to get these bus kids. You got to work hard. We got to get everybody in. We can get in this Sunday. And I remember it well because that Sunday we were having what they call dinner on the grounds. In other words, you know, we all went to church. Afterwards, we had dinner together. Well, you know what they did with the bus kids? They sent them home. And I, I was in charge of bus mission. I went, wait a second. I said, we can't do this. You're bringing kids in to try to show them Christ. And then you're saying, get out of here, you little beggars. Well, we have enjoy our food. We should be feeding them. Well, that's just too much trouble. I'm like, what do you mean? It's too, well, you're trying to show them the love of Christ and you're sending them home? I remember one of my bus workers, Eddie, he was in tears. I can't just take these. They know everybody's staying here and eating lunch. I can't take these kids home. I said, I'm sorry, Eddie. I don't know what to tell you, man. This is, this is the rules we're under. Well, he took his bus to a fast food restaurant with his own money. He fed every kid on that bus. But I'll tell you, I raised a big stink after that. I said, I will never do this again. This is wrong on every front. If you're bringing these kids in just for a number, to impress other people, how, how, what do you think Christ thinks of stuff like that? I mean, it's like churches have forsaken Christ and we're just in it for our own self. It shall not be so among you. People, we're not to be like the world. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. As followers of Christ, as those redeemed through the blood of Christ and now living for the glory of God, this it shouldn't be so among us. The phrase among us implies all the disciples, every congregation of believers. He insists on a distinct contrast between the church, the kingdom of God, and the world. We've just Christianized the world and we got this little, you know, we got preachers today flying around in multi-million dollar jets who are going to their congregation and says, I need another jet. You guys got to come up with the money. And these people are in celebrity status and they're being worshipped. I heard a couple preachers talking. They couldn't ride on normal airplanes because there's a bunch of demon-possessed people on those planes. I'm like, this is the most sickening thing in the world. This passes for Christianity? No wonder the world thinks Christianity is a joke. Because it is for the most part. Churchianity is a joke. And we've got to show them something different as the followers of Christ. Okay, I think we get it. We're called to be humble. Our Lord was humble. He, the sovereign creator of the universe, washed their feet. So we're to be humble. Well, okay, what is humility? What does it mean? We can't be humble if we don't understand what it is. Well, first of all, humility is an attitude towards God that God has absolute right over my life. He can do with me whatever He chooses to do with me, and I bow before Him and say, God's given, God's taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. And people, that has to do with circumstances, because you know if we understand God's sovereign, whatever happens in our life, God brings into our life, and He brings it in for a purpose, and the humble person says, you're the potter, and I'm the clay, and you can do with me whatever you want, blessed be the name of the Lord. Secondly, humility is a feeling of indebtedness toward people because of how graciously God has treated us. It's the opposite of feeling everybody owes you something. You know what I'm talking about. You know people like that. Everybody owes me something. I've met some rare people who felt everybody owed them nothing. But I've not met too many people like that. You know, we feel, that, well, you owe me your attention, you owe me your time, you owe me whatever. The more you are driven by what others owe you rather than by what you owe them in love and service, the less humble you are. 
Paul defined humility this way. You ready? Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourself. That's humility, people. You're counting others as more significant than yourself. Now listen, we all count some people more significant than ourselves, right? I mean, we've got our little chart. Here I am, there's people above me, but there's a whole lot of people below me. No, biblically, get yourself at the very bottom of that list so you're looking up to everybody. Everybody is more significant than yourself. This is against the grain of our culture, which is extremely self-centered. We're still part of the me generation. But you know what's funny? Everybody's you know, into themselves, but nobody really likes that other people. Do you? <laughs> I mean, we like people who are interested in us, not just themselves. We listen to people who talk about our concerns, not just their own. Therapists report that inmates of mental institutions say, I or me, 12 times more than residents of the outside world. As their condition improves, they say the patients use the personal pronoun less often. It's no surprise that a Christian who is constantly talking about himself or herself doesn't have much interest in serving others. It's all about them. So how do we humble ourselves and become a servant of all when pride is such a controlling factor in our life? Well, the solution to the problem of pride is to see yourself in a proper manner. To see yourself as someone who is saved and sustained by the grace of God alone. All we are and all we have is a gift of His grace. So we don't have anything to be proud about. So I'm really proud about my looks. God gave you those looks. I'm proud about my intelligence. God gave you that intelligence. Anything you have is a gift of His grace. You have nothing to brag about. Believer, we need to see this text as a text in which our Lord is turning the social values upside down. The secular world looks upon leadership as an opportunity to be served. I'm a leader, you serve me. A leader has a lot of people under him, and thus they use them to minister to their own needs. But in the kingdom of God, a position of leadership is simply a place of service. The Christian is to serve God by serving others. He closes by saying, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Well, the first if here is the first class conditional assumed to be true from the author's perspective. We just translate that sentence. Since you know these things, in other words, he's saying, you guys do know these things. I've taught them to you. The second if is a third class condition. Maybe you will. Maybe you won't. Blessed are you. You might be blessed. You might not. Because you might do these things and you might not. I think this kind of reflects the Hebrew verb shama which Shema means to hear so as to do. Shema Israel. The Lord our God is one. Hear so as to do. Blessed are you if you do them. Now let me ask you this. Anybody want to be blessed by Yahweh? Anybody want to be blessed? I do. Okay? Well, Yeshua here is promising God's blessing on those who practice humble service. That's what the text teaches. Blessed are you if you do them. Look at Luke eleven twenty eight. 28. He said, blessed rather are those who hear the Word of God and keep it. It's not just about listening. You hear it and you obey it. And then you're blessed in that. James 1, says, be a doer of the Word. Would you know, what, you want to know what it's like to live a happy, joyous Christian life? Well, follow the rabbi and be willing to wash one another's feet. Love one another because he loved us. This is the lesson. He's saying, love like this, disciples. This is kingdom theology. Love selfishly, humbly, in the most menial, simple necessities of life. Whatever it is, do it. Love at the lowest level of need. Follow your rabbi. Somebody has said this. You will know whether a person is a servant or not by the way they act 
when they're treated like one. You ever seen that fleshed out? Just treat somebody like a servant and see how they respond. I remember a story of Carrie and someone trying to humiliate Carrie at a meeting somewhere, a dinner, and he says, Mr. Carey, I understand that you were a lowly shoemaker. And he says, oh no, sir, just a shoe repairman. You can't humiliate a humble person. You can't do it. But it's easy to humiliate a, pride pers- a proud person. But that's the picture here. The, you know, the picture of our Lord taking the clothing of a servant, disrobing to become like a servant, washing the feet, a servant's role, and he's saying, this is what I'm calling you to do. Not that you ought to go out and wash each other's feet, but you ought to humbly serve one another in love because that's the way the kingdom operates. For, for esteeming others, all others, better than ourselves. Let's pray. Father, we thank You this morning for Your Word. Lord, it is uncomfortable It is convicting. We realize, Lord, these are your principles. We realize this is our calling. We are to serve you humbly by serving one another in the lowest, most menial tasks. Father, I ask that you would deal with our pride. Father, we know you resist the proud. That should scare us, Lord. But you give grace to the humble. And Father, may we humble ourselves before you. May we humble ourselves before one another that we may receive grace from you. Thank you, Lord, for your love to us. Thank you for that example. May we realize we are called to be different than the culture we live in. May we shine, Lord, as lights in the world. For your glory, Lord. Amen. Questions? Comments? All right, I got a question from Frank from Alabama. He said, do you think the washing of the feet had anything to do with the vacancy that was about to come to pass by the betrayer of Ju- by the betrayal of Judas? I don't know, Frank, I never thought about it in that context, I guess, and I, right now I'd have to say I don't see that, but I hadn't thought about that, so I don't, I'm not sure how that would fit in, um, but, so sorry, not a lot of help there. I got another question. Okay, this is a a question, um, Gary Cole's forwarding it from uh, Dean Barney from Kalama Falls. He says, um, do you say that Yahweh was one of the three in front of Abraham? Uh, Yes, the text says that. Uh, Genesis 18 makes it clear that those three visitors were Yahweh and two angels. Now, by Yahweh, what do I mean? I mean the second person of the Trinity, Yeshua, because Yeshua is always the visible member of the Trinity. So yes, I believe that in Genesis 18, that was Yahweh and two angels showed up to visit him. Anybody else? Yeah, that's right. All right, listen, I need you to help me out because uh, the, the, the missionary here, um, Ferdy, that was here Thursday, he said, uh, when you do the question and answer, he goes, I never hear the questions. He goes, I have to figure it out from your answer. So, uh, you know, help me to remember to repeat the question so people who are watching, you know, get both sides of it. (laughs) You're welcome, Matthew. I told, okay, Gary's, when am I going to stop? I told you this upper room discourse is, is not going to be comfortable, okay? I love teaching, you know, but I, I really like it when you can exhort and say, this, this is how we're called to live, people. And this is going to be the next four or five chapters, all about kingdom living. He's talking to his disciples. They're alone in the upper room. 
evangelism is over, that's the first 12 chapters, now I'm going to tell you people how you ought to live. And this is the call. And it just focuses on love, and I'll tell you, the church is really lousy at this. Okay, so we're going to get hit every which way in the next, I don't know, year as we go through these next five chapters. Yeah, I warned you several weeks ago. In light of that, and what we were discussing this morning, uh, how the influence of Berean throughout the world is all of God. I would pray that we would continue to use Berean in this manner, an example of love and service. service. Amen. It wasn't really a question. Gary was just saying, you know, I pray that God would continue to use Berean uh, in this manner. And this is, this is how we have to stand out, people. You know, this is how... We're going we're gonna to talk about this later to come, but this is how a disciple distinguishes themselves. Okay, he says, you will, they will know that you're my disciples by your biblical knowledge. No? Text doesn't say that? They'll know you're my disciples by your love. So if we're going to distinguish ourselves as followers of the rabbi, it's done through love. Did you have a question, Stan? Uh, you might remember way back in the late 70s, 80s. No, I can't remember yesterday. Yes, you <laughs> Anyway, uh, as you were going through the greatness, I was just, you know, one of the, their courses came to my mind. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. Yeah, I do remember that. Stan was asking about a song from the 70s that if you want to be great in God's kingdom, you got to be the servant of all. And that's true, and that's why uh, our closing song this morning is Make Me a Servant. Um, you know, it's a work of God. We have to humble ourselves before Him. We have to, first of all, the key here is we have to understand we got a pride problem. Okay? If you don't think you have a pride problem, then you've got a pride problem. If you think you're humble, then you've got a pride problem. Okay? You see, the, <laughs> the, you're just stuck, okay? We need to deal with this because we all have the same problem. You know, we like ourselves, we want to exalt ourselves, we want people to think well of us. And the Lord says, you, you know, in my kingdom, it's the person on the bottom rung who's just doing the service. They're the greatest. This is hard to wrap our head around, but we need to. Let's stand together as we close this morning by singing, Make Me a Servant.